Let's start with why equations must be balanced. In any chemical reaction, mass is conserved. This means that the number of atoms for each element must be the same before and after the reaction. Atoms don't just disappear, and they don't appear out of nowhere. They just rearrange. Take this reaction. Right now, the atoms don't match. There's one carbon, four hydrogens and only two oxygens on the left, but three oxygens and two hydrogens on the right. That's not allowed. We fix this by balancing. By increasing the number of oxygens on the left and the number of water on the right, now both sides have one carbon, four hydrogen and four oxygen. The chemical equation is now balanced. Before we dive into our main example, here are three tips to make balancing easier. Firstly, start with elements that appear only once on each side and take it from there. Secondly, balance hydrogen and oxygen last. They're usually involved in multiple compounds and can cause confusion. And lastly, treat polyatomic ions like sulfate and phosphate as single units. This can save a lot of time. Now let's go to our main example. This is a reaction between phosphoric acid and potassium hydroxide. Let's balance it step by step. Following our tips, we are looking for an element that appears only once on each side. And in our example here, that's potassium. On the right, there are three potassium atoms, so we need three potassium hydroxide molecules on the left. Now potassium is balanced. Next, we look at the phosphate ions. Phosphate is a polyatomic ion. It stays together in both reactants and products, so we treat it as one unit. There is one PO4 on each side, so that's already balanced. Now we take a look at hydrogen. H3PO4 has three hydrogens, and 3KOH also have three hydrogens. That makes for a total of six hydrogens on the left-hand side. We need six hydrogens on the right, and since water has two hydrogens per molecule, we need three water. To double check if we did everything correctly, we can now count the oxygens on both sides. We see that on the left hand side we have 4 plus 3 equals to 7 oxygen, and on the right hand side we also have 4 plus 3 equals 7 oxygens. And that's the proof that it's balanced correctly. So let's recap. Always start with elements that appear once on each side. Leave hydrogen and oxygen for later. Use polyatomic ions as single units where possible and double check by counting atoms on both sides in the end. Now that you got the method, let's try two XM style questions. Balance the following equation. Pause the video and give it a try. Since on the right side we have three magnesium atoms, we need three magnesium hydroxides on the left. The phosphate ion appears twice on the right side, so we need two H3PO4 on the left. On the left hand side we have six hydrogen from the acid and six hydrogen from the base, so a total of 12 hydrogens. To balance this we need six H2O. To confirm its balance correctly we now count the oxygens on both sides. It matches, so the equation is balanced. Now try to balance this. Pause the video and give it a try. Starting with the aluminium here will lead us in circles, so we better start with sulfur. The lowest common multiple of 8 and 3 is 24, so we need 3s8 and 8al2s3. Now we have 16 aluminium on the right hand side, so we also need 16 aluminium on the left hand side. So the final balanced equation is 16 aluminium plus 3s8 reacts to 8al2s3. First up, what's the difference between empirical and molecular formulas? An empirical formula shows the simplest whole number ratio of atoms in a compound. Example, CH2O for glucose. A molecular formula shows the actual number of each type of atom in a molecule. Example, C6H12O6 for glucose. 
you can think of the empirical formula as the simplest version of a molecular formula, which in turn is the actual formula of a compound. Now before we start solving problems, here are three things you must know. Firstly, percentage composition gives you the mass of each element per 100 gram of substance. So for example, if a compound would be made up of 50% oxygen and 50% carbon, you would simply assume 50 gram of oxygen and 50 gram of carbon. Secondly, to find moles, you use the following formula. Moles equals to mass divided by relative atomic mass. And lastly, divide each mole value by the smallest number of moles to find the simplest whole number ratio. Sounds complicated? Don't worry, let's look at an example. Determine the empirical and molecular formula for a compound with the following mass ratios. 40% carbon, 6.7% hydrogen and 53.3% oxygen. As a first step, we simply rewrite each percentage as a mass in grams. So we are assuming 40 grams of carbon, 6.7 grams of hydrogen and 53.3 grams of oxygen. The second step is to convert each mass into moles. We are using the formula mole equals mass divided by atomic mass. The atomic masses can be obtained from the periodic table. This gives us 3.33 mole for carbon, 6.7 mole for hydrogen and 3.33 mole for oxygen. Now we simply divide each mole value by the smallest mole value which is 3.33. This gives us the following ratio. 1 carbon, 2 hydrogen and 1 oxygen. So therefore our empirical formula is CH2O. Now to determine the molecular formula, you're given the molar mass of the compound. The molar mass is 180 grams per mole. Now we first check the mass of our empirical formula. We have 1 carbon, 12, plus 2 hydrogen, 2, plus 1 oxygen, 16, equals 30 gram per mole. Now we simply divide the molar mass by the empirical formula mass. 180 divided by 30 equals 6. This tells us that if we multiply our empirical formula by 6, we get the molar mass of 180. So therefore, our molecular formula is C6H12O6, that's glucose. Now let's do two IGCSE style example questions. Question 1. Determine the empirical and molecular formula for chrysotyl asbestos with the percentage composition of magnesium 28.03%, silicon 21.6%, hydrogen 1.16%, oxygen 49.21%. The molar mass is 520.8 gram per mole. Pause the video and give it a try. Step 1. We assume 100 gram and convert to moles. Step 2. We divide all moles by the smallest. In order to get whole numbers, we multiply by 2 and round. This gives us the following ratio. Mg3, Si2, H3 and O8, which is our empirical formula. Next, we calculate the mass of our empirical formula, 260.4 gram per mole. Now we divide the molar mass by the empirical mass. As the ratio is A2, we simply multiply our empirical formula by 2 to obtain Mg6 Si4 H6 O16. Question 2. A yellow dye has a composition of Carbon 75.95%, Nitrogen 17.72%, Hydrogen 6.33%. The molar mass is 240 gram per mole. Calculate the empirical and molecular formula. Pause the video and give it a try. As before, we assume 100 gram and convert to moles. 
then we divide by the smallest value. This gives us the empirical formula of C5 N H5. Next we calculate the empirical mass and divide. As we get a 3.2, we round it to the next whole number, which is 3. Finally, we multiply by 3 to get C15N3H15. A net ionic equation shows only the particles that actually change during a chemical reaction. That means the ones involved in the formation of a product like a precipitate or water. Spectator ions, that means the ions that are just floating around and don't do anything in the actual reaction, are cut out. Let's go through an example so it all makes sense. This is a neutralization reaction between nitric acid and sodium hydroxide. Both are strong electrolytes, so they fully disassociate in water. First, let's write the full ionic equation. Now we cancel out the spectator ions. Those are the ones that appear on both sides. As you can see, nitrate and sodium don't do anything so they can go. Therefore, the net ionic equation is a proton and hydroxide reacts to water. This will be the net ionic equation for any neutralization. Now, what if the question doesn't give you state symbols? You'll need to know which substances are soluble or insoluble to decide which ions stay in solution and which form precipitates. Here are the must-know solubility rules for the IGCSE chemistry exam. All sodium, potassium and ammonium compounds are soluble. All nitrates are soluble. Most chlorides are soluble except silver and lead chlorides. Most sulfates are soluble except barium, calcium and lead sulfates. Most carbonates and hydroxides are insoluble except sodium, potassium and ammonium ones. See the first rule. Now these rules help you to figure out what precipitates and what stays dissolved in a solution, which is essential knowledge to figure out the spectator ions. Now let's do a past paper style question without state symbols. Write the net ionic equation for the precipitation reaction between iron 2 sulfate and sodium hydroxide. Pause the video and give it a try. Step 1. Write down the full equation with state symbols. As we just discussed, most hydroxide are insoluble, so iron 2 hydroxide will precipitate. Now we cancel the spectator ions. Sodium and sulfate are unchanged on both sides, so they have to go. Now we are left with the net ionic equation. Iron 2 plus 2 hydroxide reacts to iron 2 hydroxide. And that's the answer. For precipitation reactions, you only show the ions that actually form the solid precipitate. Let's recap. Net ionic equations do not contain spectator ions. Those are the ions that appear on both sides of the chemical reaction. For any neutralization reaction, the net ionic equation always is H plus plus OH minus reacts to water. For precipitation reactions, only ions that actually form the solid precipitate are shown. And that's it! You now know how to write net ionic equations confidently, even when state symbols are missing. For more tips and chemistry preparation, check out our blog posts on our website. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe and drop a comment with any question you want us to cover next. See you next time!